Good morning, everyone who is joining us online. Thank you, all of our viewers. And for everyone who's been sharing, thank you. Continue to share this link. We still have time to help people catch some hope and some truth today. And I want to wish every mom a happy Mother's Day right now. Happy Mother's Day. Mom, I love you. Happy Mother's Day to you. Thank you for all that you've done. I'm talking to my mom right now. Thank you, Mom, for all that you've done for me. Appreciate you so much. And to my amazing wife, you're an amazing mom. So thank you for that. So we celebrate you and we pray today. And I, I know today that this message is really going to speak and resonate with you. It's perfect timing for all of our moms out there. So uh, be blessed today in this message. Oh, wow. Like two months ago, two months ago, life just changed on us suddenly. Life just stopped. And we went from all of a sudden doing life and being really busy to now we're working from home. Our kids are, are doing school on our dining room table and we don't get to go out of the house that much. And then something really cool happened though in the midst of this crazy pandemic and the crisis that's going on in our world. When we were told to stay home, we started seeing things that we've been missing. We started seeing things that we've been taking for granted. And we started appreciating and, and enjoying the ones around us and things that we haven't been able to do for a long time. But here's the thing, that's not going to last forever. And, and I will say this too, not everyone got to enjoy that life. We have essential workers and, and medical personnel and leaders in our community and in our world who their life didn't really stop. It actually got busier. It got crazier. And their entire rhythms and patterns changed. But for many of us, we also had this opportunity to stop and slow down a little bit and see life differently and appreciate things that we haven't been able to appreciate. And so we're getting ready to reopen. We're getting ready to get back to life again and, and the life after reopening. And it, it may not be normal again. And honestly, I don't know if I want the norm before. And so we're bringing this series to you today to ask the question, what is essential? You know, what do we want to leave behind and what do we want to pack and bring with us moving forward into the reopening of life and getting back to what, you know, what normalcy we can get back to. What, what did you find that, that you were not experiencing and enjoying before COVID-19, but since you've been having to slow down and stay home or work from home and, and be with the kids and help them, what are some things that you realize that you were missing that you don't want to let go anymore and you're going to bring with you? What are some things that you wasted your time on, wasted all your energy and, and, and focused on, and you deemed them valuable and essential, but really you found out they're not all that essential? Like, is there things that you noticed that, that is actually essential now that you didn't notice before as much? Is there things that you need to keep as essential in your life? I know personally for me, I mean, I know what's essential in my life. I know, but it doesn't mean I actually live it. And I know in my personal life, I started seeing things differently since we've slowed down. And I think it's because when you slow down, you actually have time to notice things. I got this suitcase as an example because we're talking about what are we going to call essential and we're going to pack and take us into life uh, as we reopen. And this suitcase represents what we can handle and what we can hold. And so I have some things in here that's pretty essential, you know, it, it, that we've made essential in our lives. Like for one is, is sleep. And so I'm going to put sleep back in my life or keep it in my life. And, and maybe your sleep is a little less sleep than this. Maybe it should be like a really small pillow, but I don't, I don't have that. And then we have, we have work. What about your work that you got to take with you? And so we put that back in life because 
we're working at home or maybe some of us are not working right now because we can't, but we're going to get back to work. So we put that in our life and we go forward. And then, and then we got to eat. So you got to grab your food. Notice what I grabbed. All right. We got to eat. So we got to get that in there as well. And then if, if you're trying to, you know, keep that shape, you got to exercise. I think I just broke something. I think I just broke something in my bag here. But we got to exercise, right? So we got to pack. We got to pack that in our life. We got to make sure we get that and bring it with us. And then if you have kids like we do, maybe you got to play some games and spend some, some quality time with them. And then maybe you're married. Maybe you're dating. So it's time to get back to that, that love routine again or you know, making sure you keep bringing that. It's kind of funny how small this is. <laughs> and then maybe you actually have some time for some leisure activity. And I'm going to close this, and it's just not going to close because this doesn't fit. All this struggles that fit in our lives. And I know what you're thinking right now. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking you know, the true American thought is get a bigger bag. Get a bigger bag so you can fit more stuff in it. But I got to tell you, I don't think a bigger bag helps because the bigger the bag and the more stuff you put in it, the heavier it is to carry. The heavier it is to drag with you in life. And what's crazy is I've left out some key things that belong in this bag still, like faith and having a Bible inside this bag. And, and what, about, what about family time? like quality family time. You know, what about getting that in this bag and, and be able to bring it with us to life as we reopen? And then the one I want to talk about today that is not talked about much is time. Time to rest. Time to rest. I believe what is essential to mankind, what's essential to us as we move into this next season and begin to reopen is we need rest. We need free time. We need room to breathe. We need room to enjoy life. And the Bible talks about that quite a bit, more than you would expect. But one of my favorite stories is when Mary slows down and hangs out with Jesus. And I want to read it to you. It's in Luke 10 verse 38 through 42. I'm going to read it in the NIV version for you first. It says this, As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Or indeed, only one is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. In a nutshell, we see that Mary is praised for focusing on what is important, what is essential for her well-being right now, is to be in the presence of Jesus. It is in this context that we learn the value of slowing down from the busyness of life and hanging out with life, hanging out with true life, which is Jesus Christ. So Mary wasn't just getting physical rest, she was getting soul rest. She was getting what I call double rest because she physically stopped the busyness. She didn't assume the role that typically women would assume in this time. She actually instead assumed the position that a man would do. A man would sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to his teaching. They would lounge in the room and they would listen to the teaching. But Jesus actually commended her, commended Mary 
for slowing down and hanging out with him instead of getting busy in the kitchen. And this was the custom at that time for, for the women to do that. And Jesus is breaking all those customs too. And I think it's interesting how Martha, she jumps into what she assumes she should do, preparing a meal and a feast for, for the guests, for Jesus. And so she's doing that. And isn't that kind of weird? Because don't we do that too? Don't we assume what culture says we should do? Don't we assume the roles? Don't we kind of assume what culture says and, and live and do whatever it says? But I love how Mary breaks that. Mary's like, no, nah, I'm going to hang out with Jesus. I'm, gonna not, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to worry about that right now. And I'm actually going to hang out with Jesus. And this is an amazing story for all of us to learn something. That Jesus doesn't want us to just go with the world's agenda and culture. He wants us to slow down and breathe a little bit and hang out with him. And what's really interesting about this home that Jesus is in is this is actually a place where he stopped multiple times and in a way to rest. And right now he's resting and hanging out with them before he goes to die. He's going to be dying soon in this time of biblical history. What's also really ironic is Jesus calls himself the bread of life and he just got done feeding 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. And, and Martha's concerned about feeding him, but I'm pretty sure Jesus has no problem taking care of his physical needs. Martha could have slowed down, but she, maybe, maybe she wasn't really upset because she was doing all the work by herself. What if, what if actually she wanted Mary's help so she could also get to Jesus quicker? We don't know exactly what's going on there, but it could be that what if, what if Martha wanted to be next to Jesus but she got so consumed and distracted by all the other things. But here's the reality. Martha could have stopped. Martha could have stopped and hung out with Jesus as well because that wasn't a pressing issue for Jesus to eat. What he enjoyed at that moment was to be with Mary, and I'm sure he would have enjoyed being with Martha as well. There's an amazing deeper teaching to this about the double rest because while Mary is physically resting with Jesus, he is actually what we would consider soul rest and true rest. Let me explain to you real quick what I mean by that. Because we know that the Sabbath was created for rest. The seventh day, God created everything. He took six days to create everything. And on the seventh day, he rested. And we see in history, different moments where that mattered. Moses was spoken to by God on Mount Sinai on the seventh day. There were times where uh, they had a past, the, the law was they had to celebrate the Sabbath every week because they were remembering how God saved them, the Israelites, from slavery in Egypt. You see, the Egyptians made them work every day. There was no rest. And when God delivered them out of that slavery and that craziness, he said, I want you to rest the seventh day to remember what I brought you from and to enjoy what I've done and to enjoy my presence in one another. That's what it meant to, to rest. It was to cease work and to just soak up life and soak up the, the amazing work that God has done for them. And so we see that they were called to do that during this time. But this was all future rest. This was all about pointing to future rest. Because here's what's happened. In the garden, we lost that rest. We lost that perfection. And so God is restoring it. And so there's a little taste of rest. And one of them was to practice the Sabbath on the seventh day. But then we see something amazing coming into life, into the scene. And that's in the New Testament. When Jesus comes into the scene, Jesus is that future rest that the Bible was, was pointing to in the Old Testament. And Jesus is in the temple on the Sabbath when he launches his ministry. It was on the Sabbath day, Jesus went to the synagogue. He was bat or he's water baptized. He goes to the synagogue, to the temple. He opens up the scroll in Isaiah. 
And he says, I'm the anointed one. I have come to set the captives free. Rest. Rest from everything going on in our lives. Rest from the captivity of sin. Rest from the captivity of all of our issues and struggles and guilt and shame and worries and anxieties. Jesus says, I am here to set people free. I am rest. And what's amazing too is he goes and says the, the famous line in, in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. And I want to read it to you. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. He was talking to people who carried heavy burdens, heavy burdens of legalism and religious ways and and self-righteous works, righteousness that they were working for. They were working for to be right in God's eyes. And he was like, you don't have to do that. Believe in me. Come to me all who are weary of all these extra laws and extra burdens on your life, and I will give you rest. You see, Jesus is rest. And what's amazing about the number seven is number seven actually means completeness or fullness. And Jesus kept showing up on the seventh day, and he did again to announce who he is and to say that he has come to give us rest. It's amazing. Now, the Sabbath isn't commanded in the New Testament because the Sabbath is actually fulfilled in Christ. Jesus has fulfilled the rest. The rest is pointing towards Jesus. So Jesus is rest. Jesus is fulfillment. When you have Jesus, you find completeness and fulfillment in him. And so, While it may not be a command that we have to apply today, I do believe it's a principle, and I do believe it's a practice that we should consider in our lives. And that it's important that we take time to slow down. And and there's a, a really simple way of looking at why it's important. Because physical rest allows us to soak in soul rest. Physical rest, physically slowing down, gives us the chance to get soul rest. And we need soul rest for our body, mind, and spirit. We need soul rest, which is emotional, spiritual, and mental rest for our lives. This world has gotten us so crazy busy that it's so hard to turn off our brains and our hearts and our thoughts, and our worries, and our fears. It's so hard to turn all this stuff off, but Jesus invites us to do that. The Bible invites us to practice Sabbath whenever we want. The Bible invites us to find rest in Jesus, and to come to him to find rest whenever we need it. But what's really cool is, is when we have Jesus, a lot of those things do calm down. A lot of those things that were that that rush in our minds and our hearts and our fears and our worries, they slow down when we know we have Jesus. I want to help apply this to our time today, even more so. Because I'm talking about a spiritual rest, but I'm also talking about a physical rest, like physically doing something to enjoy that rest. And again, I truly believe that if we physically slow down, we can spiritually find rest as well, complete soul rest. What I think has happened is we're finding out that because of, of being like locked down in our homes and, and this, this stay-at-home order, we saw how really busy we were. And now we realize it took that, that this pandemic to show us what truly is essential. It took a pandemic to show us that, that we do need to rest and we're way too busy as people. It took a pandemic for us to see our family and, and our friends, to see, um, even if it is online, <laughs> and, and to see uh, our neighbors. 
Like our neighbors have a life. Our neighbors exist, you know? I, we've been getting to know our neighbors. It's been amazing. And they're amazing people. And then it's gotten us to slow down and see our world and the condition that it's in. It's gotten us to see even our own condition with the extra time that we've had. We needed to slow down to see what is truly essential. And the life that we had been living, <laughs> let's be honest, guys, it wasn't really all that much of living. When you're so busy, life is more like a blur than it is living. Like, we didn't even have a chance to stop and smell the roses. You know, we didn't have a chance to even get, some, some of us may even struggle to get 30 minutes with our family. And now, now it might be even harder. So this message is even more important. When we get to the reopening of life again, some of us have been so busy that we need to apply this message as immediately or as fast as we can because we've been that busy. Rest, here's the thing about rest. Rest gives us the opportunity to reflect and appreciate what's going on in our lives. What we have in our lives. What we're blessed with in our lives. It gives us a chance to appreciate what God's been doing in us and through us in our lives. And here's the thing. Rest is good. That's what I'm saying right now. But yet, that's actually a radical statement in American society. That's radical to think rest is good because we can look weak if we're resting. Being busy and production and getting things done, that's success, right? Not if it's at the cost of your health, not if it's at the cost of your family, the cost of, of your sanity or your peace, the cost of your relationship with God. If busyness and hurry cost you that, it's not worth it. Whatever it is that you're spending your time chasing and running and doing, it's not worth it. If you can't fit it in your life, if you can't fit the essential things, if you can't have time for rest or, or time for family and, and time for God and time for the, for the neighbors around you, then to be honest with you, maybe we should start thinking whether we should bring that into our next life when everything reopens again. You know what? The first, the first person to pay the price for busyness is you. And the second is everyone around you. One of the best gifts I could have got my wife for Mother's Day was an outdoor lawn chair. One of those ones, the lounge chair where you stretch out and you can sunbathe and you can relax, you can read a book, or you can do nothing. And let me tell you something, my wife loves that chair. And she's a different person when she gets out of that chair. She might go into it really stressed. You know, maybe the kids drove her nuts, maybe I drove her nuts, but then she gets in that chair and then maybe it's 15 minutes later with no distractions and she comes out a different person. It's, it's kind of crazy. You need one of these lounge chairs. Men, parents, kids, whoever it is, go get your, your mom or grandma, whoever it is, one of these outdoor lawn chairs, these, these lounge chairs, so they can kick back and stretch out and get some rest and pray and hang out with God because it matters. It really does work. Here's the reality about rest. There is a rest that is restful, and then there's a rest that isn't. We can, like, pretend to rest. We can, like, go take a bath or go take a walk or go sit in a, in a lounge chair. But the reality is if we don't turn off our minds, if we don't turn off all the things that we're worried about and we're thinking about, if we don't step into the presence of Jesus and maybe talk to him and let some things go, and we sit there or we relax or we do something fun, so we can get our mind off these things. There is nothing wrong with that. But if we don't, it's not true rest. It, it's, it's not true rest if you're going to sit there and do this the entire time and, and, and see all these things that really get your mind distracted and, and burdened and worried. 
that's not rest. I've tried it. It doesn't work. True rest seems to stop doing everything and enjoying life and enjoying God's presence. That's what the point of the Sabbath was, is God was stopping his work and he was enjoying what he created. And he called us to enjoy all that we accomplished. And that's the thing, like you can't even enjoy what you did the first six days if you don't stop and recognize what was accomplished in your life. And you can't even celebrate if we don't stop long enough to do that. And I know we want to get back to normal, but I got to tell you something. If normal is, is missing the little things, if, if normal is missing God, if normal is, is neglecting family time and, and never stopping to see how my neighbors are doing, or feeling overwhelmed and stressed. If, if normal is having the pressure to be the answer man or to save everyone's lives and to have all the answers for everyone who comes to you about everything, if that's normal, I don't want to go back to it. And we shouldn't want to go back to it. We should seize this moment right now, this opportunity to really figure out what is essential for my life and that's what I'm packing, and that's what I'm bringing with me. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. You know what life was like before COVID-19 hit us. And this rest that many of us have gotten, and I feel bad for those who haven't. I mean, I, my busy has been a new busy. It's been crazy, but I've had to stop and, and recalibrate and find different ways to rest and, and slow down, and I have because I believe in what I'm preaching. But if we're honest, it was bad. Like, we shouldn't just have 30 minutes with our family, you know? We should be able to sit down and have dinner together and, and play a game. And we should be able to sit down and read the Bible together as a family. And we should be able to enjoy and look up at the stars instead of looking at our, our screens. I mean, do that. Do that tonight. Hopefully you have a clear night. Do that tonight. Go outside and look up in the sky. Look at how amazing the universe is that God made. Just take a moment to worship him. It will do good, your body good, your soul good. I want to encourage you to do that. There's a trap of hurry. Corey Ten Boom once said that if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. And there's truth in that because both sin and busyness have a way of getting you to be cut off from your connection with God and to other people and even to your own soul. Busyness will cut you off from, what, from your life source and from the people who matter and what your soul really needs. And the famous psychologist Carl Jung had this little saying. He said, hurry is not the devil. Hurry is the devil. The devil is in hurry. The devil is in the busyness because he knows how much damage it can do to people's lives. There was a pastor, I was reading this this past week, there was a pastor trying to help his church focus on living out the life Jesus calls essential. That's the words I'm using, but he was talking about the life that Jesus asked us to live. And his mentor said the following thing. Now remember, this is a pastor trying to teach an entire church, a large church like ours, how to live the life that Jesus would say is essential. And this is what his mentor said to him. He said, the number one problem you will face is time. The number one problem you will face is time because people are just too busy to live emotionally healthy and spiritually rich and vibrant lives. We're so busy that we can't even get to the emotional, spiritual, vibrant life that we're meant to have to be more like Jesus and to do the things that Jesus called us to do. And so what's the point of me opening up a series about all these things? And what's the point of me putting another burden on you? I don't want to do that. In fact, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to encourage you to take some burdens out of your life, even now, even before we get to reopen and go back to work and and our kids, uh, well, now they're not even going to be in school, so they're going to be with us all summer. But when life gets, to back, gets back to some type of normalcy, whatever you want to define that as, 
I'm saying let's take ownership of that and go, what is essential? And I believe truly that if we don't slow down, we're not going to notice anything else that is, that is essential. Like if we don't make time for God, we're not going to be who God is, God's purpose is for life and who he's created us to be in this life. So let me finish with this. How do we rest? How do we rest? Because that's a good question. Because we were forced into this. We were forced into this. This wasn't a choice. If it was our choice, we would still be busy right now. If it was our choice, none of this would have happened. We would have just kept trucking and moving. That's just the way we are in America. So we actually had to consciously rest. And I want to kind of bring this in together spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically with my points here. And they're deep and, the, and they're so important though. And I really want you to take these. And again, these, these type of notes will be on, online at calvarydover.org forward slash grow. But listen to this. We need to rest from playing God. We need to rest from playing God. That's how we rest. The pressure to do everything or control everything is exhausting and unhealthy. And did you know that the scripture of, of Psalm 4610, to be still and know that I am God, it means to let go and know God. It means to let go and let God. Like, stop. Let go. Let go of the grip of trying to be God and let God be God and know that he is God. So some of us need to rest from playing God. We're trying to be God for all of our situations. We're trying to control situations and it's wearing you out. I have good news for you. You can stop. You can stop and you can rest. How about this? Rest from chasing an image in someone you're not. Be who God has called you to be and do it well. You don't have to compare yourself with other moms. Dads, you don't have to compare yourself with other dads. Students, college students, young adults, kids, you don't have to compare yourself. You don't have to have what everyone else has. You don't have to be what everyone else is. You get to be who you are. That's why we taught last week that you are God's masterpiece. You are unique and valuable to him. So you can stop trying to be whatever everyone else is, and you get to be who God's created you to be. How about this? Rest from letting the world and all that it chases dictate your pace and rhythms. Think about that. The, the pace of this world tends to infiltrate our lives, and we begin to follow that pace and step into it and try to keep up. And whatever the world does and thinks and believes is important or essential, we grab it and we live it. And that's actually the opposite of what Christians are supposed to do. Christians are supposed to be counterculture. We're supposed to follow Christ and not this world. And it even includes the pace of this world. Just because everyone else is busy, and even as a pastor, I feel that pressure that if I see pastors or churches doing certain things, that means we must do it because that's success. But no, that isn't success for me. What success for me is to be led by the rhythms of Jesus Christ and his spirit. What does God have uniquely for me in my life, in my family or my church or my friends, my personal time? Just because the world says you're supposed to, they don't even say it, they just do it. Be on your phones for hours doesn't mean we have to. Stop for a moment, pause and go, why am I doing this? And remember that Jesus longs for you to sit at his feet, for you to be in his presence. He longs to be in your presence. And then rest from chasing things that are not essential. God, family, and people, those, those things are essential. They're not even things. You've heard the saying, the most important things in this world are not things. They're people. It's so true. Like, why have we allowed busyness to keep us from enjoying eternity around us? Because people are eternity. And every time you look into the eyes of people, you're looking into the eyes of eternity. That's more valuable than something like this plastic or this rubber football and and the wood that's in here and the weights. There's people around us we've missed because we've bought into the lie that to be busy is to be successful. To be hurrying means we must be doing something. 
but it's actually a sickness that is hurting our families, hurting our personal lives, our emotional health, our mental health, our spiritual health. And it's hurting our divine relationship with God. So moms, I have a a message for you today. It was this entire sermon, but I just want to give you permission right now. Moms, rest. You've done well. You're doing amazing. You're doing amazing. And you can give all of the worries and concerns to God because he's, he's such a great parent. He's an eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present parent. And your kid's going to be okay. Your kids are going to be okay. Grandmas, your grandkids, and, and your children are going to be okay. So enjoy rest today and again tomorrow. And, and find a rhythm of rest. Because, I mean, that is what the Sabbath was. Six days of work, one day of rest. But now in the New Testament, we find rest in Christ. And so rest can be at any time, at any day. We know that through the word of God, that Jesus lived out rhythms of rest. Jesus himself would go away to be alone with the Father and pray. And then he would spend time with a few his spiritual family, or the crowd, the community. He would spend his time, and and then he would even skip over certain places and stop and not not do certain things, and he would say no. Jesus had boundaries, y'all. He had boundaries. If Jesus needed to stop and slow down, certainly we need to. And moms, we're giving you permission today to stop and enjoy all that God is doing in your life to stop and enjoy motherhood. And that goes for all of us as adults, as as students, what a stressful time it's been. College students or high school, middle school, elementary, it's been stressful. But maybe we just need to stop and slow down and just thank God and praise God. Here's Here's some practical ideas. Go for a walk. Practical ideas to rest and to enjoy a Sabbath time, a Sabbath moment. Go for a walk, ride a bike, do some gardening or lounge with a glass of iced tea outside. Play games with the family, read your Bible and pray and thank and worship God. You spend time worshiping with a playlist, spend some fellowship with someone in your home or, or maybe a neighbor six feet away. Maybe you can look up at the sky tonight or even during the day, sit by a fire pit, Go fishing, barbecue something, try something new, visit a bench and relax. Do whatever you got to do to just do nothing but to rest and thank God and enjoy all he's done in your life. And use this rest in this moment to recharge and rejuvenate your life. We're going to discuss time quite a bit in this series because time affects everything that is essential because time itself is essential. And as you can tell in this series or in this message already today, the time is a factor for rest. So I'm praying that you're encouraged by this. I'm saying boldly and unashamedly that we need to make rest essential moving forward. We need to make room to breathe quality time for ourselves and for those around us essential. Let me pray for you. God, We thank you so much for your word and for what you're trying to teach us today. God, I pray that you would help us to apply what we're hearing to be counterculture to our world. We thank you for this gift that we've gotten, this time to stop and slow down and reevaluate what is essential in our lives and what isn't. God, I pray you would help us to know what we should pack into our new life of reopening and what we shouldn't. God, I pray we'd be courageous and bold and and determined to leave things behind that were damaging our souls, damaging our families and relationships, and even keeping us away from your mission of loving our neighbors and the lost. God, I pray you'd wake us up, Lord, to see how important this is and how essential you are and that your word is leading and guiding us to determine what is essential. We thank you for all the moms. 
God, we are so grateful for mothers. We wouldn't be here without them. Be with all those who have lost their mother during this time. As that's difficult, it's a difficult day to think about that, God. So I just pray you would comfort and be peace among them. Thank you, Lord, for what our mothers have passed down. Give them strength. God, give them peace. And Lord, give them the courage to even slow down and rest and the trust to know that you'll take care of the details as we hang out with you. We love you, God. We praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you, church, for hanging in this long. And uh, that was just the beginning of this series. We're so excited about it. And we have a special treat for you today where you can watch an interview with me and moms, even my own moms in it. So we're going to uh, be having that video up today online for you. And I, I, it was it was awesome. It was a great conversation. I got to speak to to a mom who is single with kids. I got to speak to a, a married mom, a mom who's pregnant with a child on the way. And um, wow, uh, just five different moms, different contexts, different situations. And we really talk about pressures in life, identity, and how they're handling this uh, this uh, COVID-19 crisis and being at home. So don't miss it. I, I know it will be encouraging to you. And I'm sure you'll find some solidarity as well in what they say. So God bless you. Enjoy your time and your family today. I love you. And we hope to see you soon.